Welcome, Riverwood. It is good to be together. And believe me, we are together right now in our Good Friday service. We want to focus on the cross and the finished work of Christ on the cross, not only for our redemption, but to bring us newness of life, life in Him, in Christ Himself. This is a time of worship. This is a time of reflection. And just as in our past services, our focus will be on the cross, we'll have that same image for you for this service right now. The theme of our service can be summarized by that beautiful verse found in Isaiah 53, 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Let's worship together and let's be encouraged together. We have been the recipients of unspeakable mercy and grace. Come, said Jesus' sacred voice. Come and make my path your choice. I will guide you to your home, weary pilgrim. Hear the come. Thou, who homeless soul forlorn, long hast borne the proud world's scorn, long hast roamed the barren waste, we This is the truth of who we are. To begin with, there is none righteous. No, not even one. No human being has ever been righteous in himself. So let us put far from our minds the falsehood that there have ever been men or women in themselves who have attained to a standing before God in righteousness. You might as well banish from your mind the idea that any human being has ever even had a holy thought or love for a holy God in his natural heart. You may say, I'm not so bad. There are many people worse than I am. But God's indictment is sweeping. It reaches all. Do not think for a moment that the condemnation of God applies to the, quote, heathen, as most do. We are those whom God says, There is no distinction, none righteous, All sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are brought under the judgment of God. For all human beings are alike. We're just common sinners. You and I were born in this lost race with all evil things possible to us. You might as well just believe it. The heart is deceitful above all things 
and is desperately wicked. The first step of wisdom is to listen to the worst God says about us, for He loves us more than we can ever imagine. And the more you discover yourself to be a common sinner, the more you will realize God's uncommon grace. The truth is, you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Until man knows his state of sin, he wants no grace. Grace is the truth that God himself takes the place of the seeker, convictor, persuader, giver, and final perfecter of all man's salvation. His sovereign grace goes ahead of and brings into being all human response to God. Christ bore our sins in his body on the tree. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was forsaken of God. God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for our trespasses. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that the truth of our lives is that we were literally dead in our trespasses and sins. But Father, equally true that as believers in Jesus Christ, you have made us alive together with him. For by grace we have been saved. And Father, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Through the shedding of his blood, he completely satisfied the wrath of God and brought redemption to us through the cleansing of our sins. And Father, through the work of the cross, he took us out of Adam and brought us into himself, where we died with him and were raised with him to newness of life. What an amazing work, Father. We thank you for that finished work of Christ on the cross. May you be glorified as we worship together and find joy in his finished work. In Jesus' name, amen. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said. And they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one? He replied, It is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me, for the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, All of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. 
Peter said to him, If everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid. Tenderly mourned and wept Angels in robes of light arrayed Guarded me whilst thou slept Lest I forget Gethsemane Lest I forget thine agony Lest I forget thy love for me Lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee. Even Thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, Lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that, if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, Are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But no, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Gethsemane means oil press. Since oil is used in the Bible to symbolize the Holy Spirit, it may be said that the garden is where 
the Spirit of God was crushed. Jesus agonizes over what he is to go through, feeling that he is at the point of death. Yet he prays, Not my will, but thine be done. They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. And there he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their stories straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, This man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, You must be one of them because you are a Galilean. Peter swore, A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. Very early in the morning, the leading priest, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, Are you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone they requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. 
for he realized by now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, Then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, Crucify him! So, to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's court headquarters, called the praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. He was despised, rejected, and abused. It is at this point that Jesus suffers a severe physical beating during a flogging, a victim was tied to a post, leaving his back entirely exposed. The Romans used a strip consisting of small pieces of bone and metal attached to a number of leather strands. The number of strikes is not recorded in the Gospels. The number of blows in Jewish law was set at 40 but later reduced to 39 to prevent excessive blows by counting error. The victim often died from the beating. 
Roman law did not put any limit on the number of blows given. The crown of thorns may have covered the entire skull. The thorns may have been one to two inches long. The Gospels state that the Roman soldiers continued to beat Jesus on the head, likely driving the thorns into the scalp and forehead, causing severe bleeding. From the beating, Jesus walked on a path, carrying the crossbar of the cross across his shoulders to be crucified at Golgotha. The total distance has been estimated at 650 yards. The crossbar probably weighed between 80 and 100 pounds. It is our privilege now to come to the observance of the Lord's table. Please take the elements, the bread, and the cup provided by the church, or perhaps you have provided the elements for yourself. Even if you do not have the bread or cup, you can still enter into the reality of this time by focusing your attention on the biblical significance of the body of Christ broken for us and the blood of Christ shed for us. Allow me to read from the Word of God. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. In Isaiah fifty-two fourteen, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured be- beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Please take the bread in your hand and hold it as we pray. If you do not have the bread, focus your attention on the meaning of the unleavened bread, that Jesus lived a sinless life and took our sin upon himself. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of 1 Peter 2, verses 24 to 25. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And for the words of Second Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Father, we give you our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The scriptures tell us that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. A passerby named Simon, who was from Serene, 
was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah this king of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. Jesus was then crucified. Nails about seven inches long and with a diameter of three-eighths of an inch were driven in the wrists. It was possible to place the nails between the bones so that no fractures occurred. Nails in the palms of the hand would not support the weight of a body. Standing at the crucifixion sites would be upright posts standing about seven feet high. The crossbar was then lifted onto the pole. The feet were then nailed to the pole. To allow for this, the knees had to be bent and rotated laterally, being left in a very uncomfortable position. The sign was hung above the victim's head. Having suffered from the beatings and flogging, Jesus suffered from severe loss of blood. The arms being held up outward held the rib cage in a fixed manner, making it extremely difficult to exhale and impossible to take a full breath the victim would only be able to take very shallow breaths. Jesus was offered two drinks on the cross. The first, which he refused, was a drugged wine mixed with myrrh. He chose to face death without a clouded mind. The second drink, which he accepts moments before his death, is described as a wine vinegar. Two points are important to note. The drink was given on the stalk of a hyssop plant. During the Passover, hyssop was used to apply the blood of the Passover lamb to the wooden doorposts of the Jews. This hyssop stalk pointed to the blood of the perfect lamb which was applied to the wooden cross for the salvation of all mankind. In addition, the wine vinegar is a product of fermentation, which is made from grape juice and yeast. The word literally means that which is poured and is related to the Hebrew term for that which is leavened, a biblical symbol of sin. When Jesus took this drink, it is thus symbolic of his taking the sins of the world into his body. The cross brought to an end God's overlooking sin by judging it, even to the utter divine forsaking of him whom God sent to bear sin. Sin, therefore, is brought into the open. God's wrath from heaven is now revealed against it all. If the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses believers from all sin, then no sin has been left unjudged at the cross. 
and no sins will be unjudged upon the lost at the great white throne. In grace, God at the cross had come forth, not in law or judgment, but as he was in his being, that is, absolutely as love, offering pardon and justification to men. Therefore, all he was against the awful thing, sin, must, along with his pardoning grace, be revealed. For he spared not his own son. Now, why did he die? Or if you wish, why must he die at all? Death is the wages of sin, and he had none. Why should he die? Let's look in the Word of God. In Leviticus, the shed blood on the Day of Atonement witnessed that a death had taken place. The person for whom the blood was shed could not approach or stand for a moment in the presence of the infinitely holy God. When the high priest came in before God on the great day of atonement, carrying the basin containing the poured out lifeblood of the slain goat, he carried the censer and the cloud of incense filled the Holy of Holies, covering from all human sight or approach the golden covering of the ark called the mercy seat, where dwelt upon the cherubim the Shekinah presence of God. There the high priest sprinkled the blood upon the mercy seat. This was the blood of the goat designated for God. Therefore, we have here the holy and righteous claims of the throne of God as to sin completely met. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this golden covering of the ark is always called by the same Greek word, hilasterion, which we translate propitiation, or mercy seat. We can say, therefore, that at the cross, God displayed Jesus himself as that very mercy seat in the very place where propitiation was accomplished. He was the Lamb slain whose blood cleanses us from all sin. God was satisfied. Now, what does this reveal to us? An angry, vengeful God? No, but infinitely the very opposite. One who would send his son as the spotless lamb to pour out his blood for us sinners. But this laid down life witnesses that all approach to God on our personal part is absolutely impossible. We come as those whose substitute has been stricken unto death. 
and that death by the forsaking and wrath of God Himself. There is such peace through His blood, but a peace that leaves for us in our own own right no place whatsoever. Here is the offense of the cross. Shall Christ be beaten for my sin? Then I deserve such beating. Shall Christ be forsaken? Then I should have been forsaken. All my hopes in myself have perished forever. For he who stood in my place has been smitten, forsaken, has died. All this men hate and will not hear. The truth concerning atonement is that God's wrath fell upon Christ, bearing your sins and my sins. Man's unbelief has sought in every way to avoid this awful truth. But if divine wrath fell not on Christ, it must fall upon us, for God cannot let sin pass. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And we preach Christ crucified, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now would you take the cup, the juice, Let's focus our attention on the meaning of the blood of Jesus Christ shed in remission of our sins. Psalm 22, verses 14 and 15 state, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. In Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Would you pray with me again, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the words of 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. We give you our praise, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. The scriptures tell us that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. 
What a privilege it is to come to the Lord's table as those who belong to Jesus Christ. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then, at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. Some women were there, watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate could not believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead. So Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth. Then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where Jesus' body was laid. While many of the physical signs preceding death were present, one possibility is that Jesus did not die by physical factors which ended his ability to live, but that he gave up his life of his own accord. His last statement, Into your hands I commit my spirit, shows that Jesus' death occurred by giving himself up. Jesus has stated that only he had the power to lay down his life, and he proved his power over death by his resurrection. Men must cease even seeking. They must cease all works, weeping, confessing, repenting, even earnest praying, and simply believe God laid their sins, their very own sins, all of them, on Christ at the cross. There comes a moment when a man ceases from his own works, hearing that Christ finished the work and paid the ransom at the cross. Then he rests. Such a soul believes, knowing himself to be a sinner and ungodly, but he believes on God just as he is and knows he is welcome. Faith sees that what God says has been done and believes God's word, having the conviction that it is true and true for ourselves. In saving faith, then, you do not trust God to do something for you, he has sent His Son, who has borne sin for you. You do not look to Christ to do something to save you. He has done it at the cross. You simply receive God's testimony as true, setting your seal there too. You rest in God's word regarding Christ and His work for you. You rest in Christ's shed blood. The believer is identified with Christ in his death. Not only was he crucified on Calvary, I was crucified there as well, in Him. This means the end of me as a sinner in God's sight. It means the end of me as a person seeking to merit 
or earn salvation by my own efforts. It means the end of me as a child of Adam, as a man under condemnation of the law, as my old, unregenerate self. The old, evil I has been crucified. It has no more claims on my daily life. This is true as to my standing before God, as it should be true as to my behavior. The believer does not cease to live as a personality or as an individual, but the one who is seen by God as having died is not the same one who lives. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The Savior did not die for me in order that I might go on living my life as I choose. He died for me so that from now on, he might be able to live his life in me. The life which I now live in this human body, I live by faith in the Son of God. The Christian lives by continual dependence on Christ, by yielding to him, by allowing Christ to live his life in him. Thus the believer's rule of life is Christ and not the law. It is not a matter of striving, but of trusting. He lives a holy life, not out of fear of punishment, but out of love to the Son of God, who loved him and gave himself for him. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The love of God could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quail, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure the saints and angels' song. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their son. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger
earth in darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is Our merciful and gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the maker of heaven and earth, we thank you, our Father, for your protection over us, especially at this uh, time when the entire world's attention is focused on the coronavirus. We thank you for your grace in enabling us to be able to see this day, a day that we remember in a very special way the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, made on our behalf. Not because he was guilty, not because he was sinful. There was no sin in him. All that he suffered was due to us. But Lord, he lovingly, graciously, and mercifully went to the cross to give his life as a ransom for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege that you give us uh, to be able to worship you uh, at all times, in all circumstances. We thank you, our Father, for our being able to do so uh, this evening. We thank you for the gifting that you made to those who have the technical knowledge to be able to allow us to gather together in the way in which we did in a virtual form. Uh, we do thank you for that, our Father. And uh, we do pray that, uh, Lord, as we look ahead to the future, regardless of what you may have for each one of us individually, as you are children, we know that you hold the future in your hands. And we can trust you with the full assurance that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, all will be well for those who know the Lord Jesus. And Father, there are many uh, who are still outside the faith, who have not put their trust in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would be pleased to use uh, the coronavirus and all of the other issues surrounding it. Our Father, to point them by your Spirit and through the teaching of your Word to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and gave himself for them. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, many will come to righteousness through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. For in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>